Allahi wa barakatuh. Sister, how are you? Alhamdulillah, how are you? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Um, so um, today we have Sister Rosaline Batul. So Sister, if you could just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about what you do. Okay, alhamdulillah, bismillah. So I am a um, transformational expert um, and I help coaches, healers and therapists um, recover from trauma without years of therapy um, to make more money in their business. And I'm also a mother of three, um, I run a five-figure business and I'm in Iqabi and I live up north, <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, that's really mashallah, interesting. So yeah. before I go into what a transformational expert is, um, before you enlighten us about that, can you um, just give us a little background of how you started to wear the niqab, like even just like generally um, like what what made you wear the niqab as a Muslim and you know was you always Muslim or like have you become Muslim how did that go and what's your family background a little bit okay so um basically my family are Persian Polynesian so my, my family are mainly Arab but my father's mm -hmm. side goes into the Polynesian side um, mm -hmm. I didn't grow up Muslim my mom we actually hated Muslims I, I don't like saying that but we did I got bullied a lot by Muslim school and um, kids in school so I grew up disliking Islam I really didn't didn't like Muslims and I never understood why women covered but my mom she was raised a Muslim but Shia so she used to tell me that oh uh, women cover because the men forced them to because she was forced to wear hijab when she was a kid so when she left um, my father she just disowned the religion and we went from Christianity to atheism to Jehovah's Witness we went to a lot of religions um, and then I started modeling and um I thought that was my freedom, but I was never happy. And then um, I, I went to university and I came across some Muslim girls. This is a funny story. <laughs> so these Muslim girls came up to me and they were like, are you Muslim? I was like, yes, <laughs> I am Muslim. Because I was so yeah, scared I of them because I thought, I thought they would bully me. So I was like, yeah, I'm Muslim. Yeah. And they're like, okay, come, you should come over for dinner. You know, we'll have a great time. So I went over for dinner and then I asked them like, why do you cover? And they were like, I was like, why, why do you let your fathers or your, or your brothers force you to wear the hijab? And they were like, we don't do it for our fathers or our brothers or the men in our family. We do it for God. Like, we do it for Allah. And I was like, oh, okay. So they pointed me towards the ayah in the Quran, which is, um, I think it was Surah Al-Azab, where the women covered. And when I read the hadith or the tafsir that went with it, and... Um, how, like so how this like gives me shivers like it makes my gives me goosebumps like when the women heard that ayah the first thing they did was rip off their garments and cover their face and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not say anything he did not tell the women how to interpret that ayah and that for me was liberating i just sat there, like wallahi i sat there crying like oh my god like i remember making dua to allah said allah please forgive me like for the way I've been talking about the religion and then I I, I took my shahada there, there and then and it was just like yeah that's really then, amazing yeah it's really really amazing because I think uh, I think like being a revert as well one of the most difficult things for a lot of reverts is actually covering because yeah it's a big like step like it's one thing that you know you believe in Islam and stuff like that but just to change how you look how you dress you know, especially like if you're used to, you know, you said you've been a model as well. So you're yep. obviously you be somebody that's used to not wearing much clothes, maybe, and exactly. dressing up very stylishly and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. When you're very um, conscious about, you know, how you look and looking attractive and looking beautiful. This is one of the main things like a lot of sisters when they come into Islam, it's just like, oh, do I really have to wear a headscarf? Or like maybe they're practicing and everything they pray, but the headscarf is something that they find really difficult because they don't want people, especially even their families, to look at them in a different way and think yeah. that they don't have, like, a daughter anymore or a sister anymore. They feel like, oh, you know, you've changed too much. So that's one of the things that is, you know, it, it causes, it's, a, it's a quite reluctant, a lot of sisters find it quite reluctant to do. Yeah, yeah subhanAllah, that's really that amazing. Happened to me. That happened to me, though, like, you know what you mentioned about being... um. Um, disowned from your family. My mm -hmm. mom disowned me for like a whole year when I won a club. She disowned me. Wow. She said to me that I don't like you're not my daughter anymore because she was used to seeing me like modeling. I used to do catwalk yeah. modeling. I used to do a lot of like you know magazine photo shoots. And she had she was used to seeing her daughter always dressed up and looking nice. So she was like, mm -hmm. you're wearing this thing on your face and like you look hideous. You look like a black bin liner. And then 
obviously back then I was so angry because obviously when you when you come to the dean you think you're better than everyone and that's what I thought honestly I thought I was better than my family which is which is a wrong attitude to have so that's why me and her clashed I was like oh you know like you know I'm better than her and you know like because I'm a Muslim now I, I felt so great and obviously that was a wrong attitude to have so when she disowned me I took a step back and I was like you know what let me just show her through my actions, like I've changed because she, I, I, I was like, a, I, when I was growing up, I was very angry. I was always getting into fights. I was always like hanging out with the wrong girls, the wrong people. I used to hang out with a lot of boys. So my mom saw how much I changed and she was like, wow, this religion has really changed you. And Alhamdulillah, she took a shahada like three years later. Alhamdulillah. 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 Because Alhamdulillah. of the way I was towards her, I was always very kind towards her, I was respectful. Mm-hmm. When she started like, telling me about Islam, I was like, you know what, mom, you have your opinion. And you have a right to it. And I used to leave it as that. And I used to try and sway her make, and force her to believe. And then she came to her own conclusion just by the way I was acting. Alhamdulillah, guidance comes from Allah. But do you get me? It was yes, um, it, it's character. It's like your character as well. Like obviously when, because when you're used to like just putting yourself out there and getting validation, which is what you were p- uh, um, hinting on that, you know, a lot of girls struggle with that because and, and I find it's because uh, most of us girls didn't have that father figure in our lives. I didn't have a, I have a father figure in my life. So I was constantly seeking validation from other people. And that's why, I, as for, for me personally, when I first wore it, it wasn't hard for me to wear because I was seeking validation from something. And that was my validation that I'm worth it. That I'm so I'm worthy of, you know, being judged for my intellect and not for the way I looked. SubhanAllah. That's really quite... Um... Well, it's, it's just a massive leap. Yeah. And I think uh, it really is a massive leap because, uh, as I said, like, it's just like what you're saying is really the opposite of what a lot of people believe about the niqab. You know, mm. thinking that, especially you yourself, you got you went from believing that a woman is forced to dress like that from believing yeah. that that was your complete rights to dress like that. Mm, exactly. And it was, it was so liberating. I can't, like, and so many... Like non-Muslims come to me and say, are you forced to wear that? I'm like, no, I'm an ex-model. I know what it's like to be judged by men. And in the modeling world, there's only men that are judging you. They are telling you how to dress. They are telling you how to look. The magazines, the editors are men. They're not women. So it's the men that are telling women how to look. And we have been given this false perception of beauty that is according to how the men want it. So when I tell non-Muslims that I went from that to this and I, I found freedom in it, they realize that, wow, that she's telling the truth because she's been there i've been down that road of like seeking validation from the looks and the likes well obviously back then it was on social media but still getting the looks and the opinions and like being told you're beautiful that was my validation back then but now my validation is being judged by my intellect and obviously i validate myself i love myself but just being judged by my intellect and what i have to say is so much more um liberating than being judged by the way you look yeah, subhanAllah. So it's all about like having that self-love. And I think that that's one of the challenges that you face when yeah. as a Muslim woman, like you, you have to focus on that. I think that there's a lot of sisters who do wear hijab and niqab. They're covering themselves, but they still have like, they still haven't complete self-love. They don't really love themselves. Right. So they're maybe struggling in their life with other issues and things like that. So I want to ask you about this transformational coaching that you do. Yeah. Um, because you do help women with these kind of issues as well. You give them advice and coaching. Yeah. You could talk a little bit about that. So, yeah, basically what I do is um, every every issue that you have from depression to anxiety to even the fear of success is all rooted in a trauma. So I studied, um, I've been studying mindset since the age of 13. Alhamdulillah, my mom used to get me to read books about mindset and about millionaires and billionaires. So I've been raised with that mindset. And one thing that, that everything has, Every symptom, but every everything that's like a depression and anxiety, that's an underlying um, symptom of trauma. So when I speak to sisters who are struggling with their with their self worth and their self confidence, when you take it back to childhood, they never felt good enough. So they carry on that belief into their adult lives, and they're constantly trying to seek validation, trying to fix people, getting into abusive relationships having toxic friendships because they have that belief that they're not good enough, which started from between the ages of one to eight. So we form those beliefs according to what we hear from our parents, from our caregivers. If you were bullied in school, you're going to have an even deeper belief that you're not good enough. So what I do in my in my sessions is I help these women to 
release that belief and change it to I am enough and change those meanings that they've held around those certain events from childhood and help them change the meaning by helping them understand that this isn't you may have gone through that but it's not you it's not who you are you are enough and you deserve more in life you deserve to be happy you deserve to be loved and alhamdulillah after one session with me um most of my clients feel better that like, the anxiety has gone the depression has gone the the trauma the pain from the trauma has gone so yeah that's basically the nutshell so I suppose that like, I suppose um you know it's, it's quite amazing work that you do and obviously it's a process um, that people have to like you know go through these things and by you pointing out you know it's just like um they say you um one of the first steps to recovery is realizing that you've got a problem isn't it exactly yes because a lot of us are in denial mm. we are in denial and we're blaming people and we refuse to take responsibility for our own healing look you have a right to hurt but you have no right to keep hurting yourself and that's why i keep telling people that you have a right to hurt someone could have abused you like me i was sexually abused as a child and i tell this a lot to people for them to realize that it happens and i know brothers i know men who have been sexually abused and too, they're too afraid to speak out but then when you when you hear another muslim person saying it it helps other people think oh i went through that but if you went through something that's like sexual abuse whether it was bullying whether it was narcissistic abuse from parents whether it's toxic behavior you have a right to hurt but you have no right to keep hurting yourself in the sense that you start blaming other people or you start getting triggered by everything or you um, stay um, stay stuck on medication or you stay stuck in a vicious cycle of like feeling unhappy and feeling suicidal and committing emotional suicide because a lot of us commit emotional suicide we keep telling ourselves i'm not good enough i'm not good enough for money i'm not good enough to be happy i'm not good enough to feel beautiful we keep committing emotional suicide and you have no right to do that because you as a human being should be thriving we live in 2019 we live in the era of thriving we're no longer hunting our food we're no longer hunting for anything. We are, everything is at, is at our fingertips. Alhamdulillah, Allah has made it easy for us. So we should be thriving. So if you have gone through trauma and pain, you have to like recognize that and get help. So that's why I say to all, like, on my Instagram feed, on my Facebook, I'm always telling people that you need to recognize the triggers and realize that when you are going through something, when you are attracting people into your life who are toxic, that means is that there's something going on inside of you that you need to heal. Subhanallah. So yeah, it's like when you when you were saying this, it just reminded me of like even you know in our religion, um, you know we're warned about the whispers of the shaitan, yeah. And like what what the the things that you think we're not punished for our thoughts, but yeah. the reality is when you when you keep thinking something and you allow these thoughts to become words, and then you be, allow those words to even become actions, you know. Yeah. So it's it's important to try to get rid of these kind of negative thoughts from the beginning when they first come into your mind. You know, say Allah billahi min shaitan rajim, and these things. Try to get these kind of thoughts from your mind and not listen to them, because this is one of the things that even Iblis on the day of judgment, you know, when um, people try to blame him for their actions, he's going to say, "Well, I didn't force you to do anything. I just exactly. I suggested to you, and you decided to do it." You know, exactly. so it comes down to you know self worth as well. Obviously, if we don't love ourselves, then we can't really love other people. Right, it's true. And it's like, you know, I always use that ayah in the Quran where Allah says, um, good men are for good women and bad men are for bad women in the sense that you attract who you are. You attract and we also, our environment mirrors our internal world. So if you are around toxic people, you have to look at yourself and think, where am I being toxic in my life? Where have I got hidden traumas? Where have I got unhealed wounds? And how can I fix that? Because I promise you, like, I've, I've been doing this work for like three, three, four years now properly. And alhamdulillah, since I healed those wounds of um, abuse, of bullying, of like seeing domestic violence when I was a kid, when I healed those wounds, I stopped attracting toxic people into my life. I don't, I don't have toxic friends in my life. I recognize the signs straight away. I no longer try and fix people, which is what I find a lot of women do, that when they don't feel validated within, they become codependent and they start trying to fix people and people please until they burn out. And one way that women do this is with their husbands. They try mm -hmm. and make their, their husbands their God. To the point that they burn out they are completely burnt out they feel underappreciated they don't feel loved because it never came from themselves you have to love yourself first you have to know who you are before you can take anyone else on you have to love yourself your cup has to be full before anyone else can take from it and a lot of us are struggling with that because we don't know how to love ourselves because we were never taught how to we were never taught in school how to love ourselves so this is what i try and teach
Yeah, subhanAllah. So can I ask you with regard to obviously wearing the niqab, do you think it's something that's given you more confidence or do you think that you was able to wear it because you found yourself in a place of having more confidence? Yeah, I, I, I honestly believe like the, the niqab gives me a lot more confidence because I'm unique. Like it makes me feel so unique and it's my devotion. It's like I'm expressing my devotion to Allah. It's not my barrier between me, me and the world. It's my expression of spirituality and how I can do some extra ibadah for mm. Allah. Like I, I've been Muslim for 10 years now. I wore niqab straight away, but then I was um, uh, assaulted on a bus. So I was punched in the face on a bus. That's and fine. then I was um, because of that, it, it made me remove the niqab. I was like, okay, I don't, wanna, I don't want that to happen again. I was traumatized by it. But then mm. Alhamdulillah, after, after a year, I put it back on and I did it with confidence. I was like, you know what? I'm not going to allow anyone to get in the way be um, between me and Allah because this is how, this is me expressing my religion. And I feel proud of it. Like I'm a Muslim. I've been through, like, alhamdulillah, I've had so many bad experiences. And just wearing the niqab for me, it makes me feel peaceful. <laughs> it makes me, yeah. like, it gives me peace. <laughs> so I don't have to worry about my face. I used to spend six hours doing my makeup. <laughs> I wow. can't believe that. My hair, I used to have extensions, get fake eyelashes, do my nails. I do not know how I had time for that. It used to take me six hours to leave the house. Oh, like, no. I could work three jobs. I had to wake up at five o'clock in the morning just to get my face right. Wow. And now I literally put my niqab on, walk out the door, two seconds. It's just yeah. like, do you get me? I don't have to worry about my hair. I don't have to worry about my face. I could have pimples all over my face. No one's going to know. I could have like a cold sore on my, on my lip. No one's going to know. And for me, it gives me confidence that, like, wow, I'm being judged by the way, by, by the way I talk and by my energy, like how I put myself across. Like to, to, uh, I feel myself that that gives me the power, like in the sense that I have control over how people view me. Because people aren't judging me by the way I look anymore. People aren't judging me because I have nice eyelashes or I have nice eyebrows. And you know how we go for Instagram and we're constantly looking at like there's girls on there who, who who look nice and you think, oh, well, alhamdulillah, I don't have to be judged for that anymore. I can just be judged for the way I speak and for my intellect. Yes. Subhanallah. You know, sometimes I think to myself, like, because obviously in society now, and you've been in the fashion industry, you know about these things, but I think that women generally a lot of women part of the reason why they're unhappy with themselves is because they're always comparing themselves to others and how other yep. people look and you know yep. what other people have as well and i think um you know just wearing hijab in general you know when you're when you somebody who wears more clothes you know not showing your body and things kind of things it helps you to you know you you stop thinking about the, the physicality of somebody else and you know who's got bigger what and smaller yeah. this right. you know this kind of things like even the relationships between women you know, as, as, as especially as Muslim women, like your your relationship isn't based on those things, right? So you exactly. think you think you know you, you're just your mind is on something else. Like you focus on the relationship with your you know you, with your friend rather than oh well you know I like her because she's good looking or yeah. you know if it's I might be spending more time with this woman like you know because she looks nice then maybe I'm going to get more attention or something like that. Because I think, you know, in society we have that, like, you know, especially when I was in college, one of the things like, you know, as, as a black girl, I used to get judged a lot by other black people because I wouldn't dress or behave maybe as um, other black people behaved. So people used to think that, oh, like, you know, look how she behaves and she's, and I hang around with different types of crowds. I didn't care the color of anybody's skin. I hang around with anybody. So people that, like, when I used to talk to my black friends, they'll be like, oh yeah, you know, everybody thinks you're a bounty because like, <laughs> you know, like you're dressing and stuff like that. And, you know, but, and then when they would, when, when I meet up with their friends, so their other black friends, they'd be really surprised. Like, by like you know the way I talk and how I act because I seem just like a regular black person for them but looking at me and how I was dressing you know they would interpret it that oh like maybe she thinks that she's white or she's trying to be white or something so you do get you do get um judged a lot by your appearance yeah. um, you know th there's so many ways that you can be judged by your appearance when you're you know it, it's that like, appearance is part of obviously identity yeah. and um you know it doesn't necessarily it doesn't necessarily display like exactly how you think as a person I think mm -hmm. sometimes it's just like for example somebody who's got a lot of tattoos you know yeah. sometimes people who see somebody well like maybe they've got tattoos on their face or something like that might think oh like that person's really scary or they're a thug or they're a criminal or something but 
they could be like a really intellectual person and That's you know it's, it's like there's stereotypes that are acquainted with dressing a certain way and obviously as Muslim women we experience that a lot because yeah. wearing hijab and especially the niqab we're seen as people who are you know oppressed because why would anybody want to dress like that that's not fashionable is it so and another thing so funny that like you touched upon like I remember that someone on my Facebook she's like she's not a Muslim woman she was like why would you want to wear something as hideous as that I said you're entitled to your opinion and this is my opinion about how I want you to judge me like you may think it's hideous but to me it's the most beautiful thing this mm-hmm. veil is, is proving to like showing to people that I don't care what you think of me I don't care I like how you see me this is my stance to say that you bet you have to judge me by what I say and how I think and that's it you can't judge me by how how like curvy I am how beautiful I look you can't judge me on that way and this is this is the issue this is what's causing so much anxiety and depression in kids like there's little girls out that are five years old who don't I remember my son subhanAllah when he was five he said to me mom I want to be white and I looked at him and said are you okay and he was like, Mom, I want to be white. Because at that time, he was going to a predominantly white, um, it was like a predominantly white school. He went there for like two days a week. And he goes, Mom, I just want to be white. Mm. And I was like, wow, like, appearance affects kids. And I'm not saying, obviously, in, at, at, that set, at that age, they are aware of themselves. So can you imagine how kids are feeling when they, they see other women and they look up to other women and they, they're feeling like, oh, I don't look like her, so there's something wrong with me. And this is the issue. This is what, this is what I talk about in my, in my coaching, that, when you go, when you are looking at people, you're not thinking, oh, wow, she's beautiful. You're thinking she's more beautiful than me. There's something yes, wrong yes. with me. You get yeah. me? Yeah, like, definitely. And I'm not saying that it's, it's a woman's fault. It's not. It's not a woman who beautifies herself. It's just that we have all within us that we feel that we're not good enough and we're not beautiful enough and we're not pretty enough. And it comes from this, this man-made society of perfectionism, that this is mm. the perfect woman. You know how to do these face swaps of, this is what the perfect woman is, like Angelina Jolie and Kendall Jenner, they put them together and they go, this is a perfect woman, she has a perfect ratio. Like, this is what men come up with. This is not, this is not normal. <laughs> it's not real. It's not real life. Who does that? Who sits there and analyzes people's faces? And this is causes massive depression and anxiety in kids. That like kids want to commit suicide because they don't look like Kendall Jenner. This is like a real life. It's like a real life crisis that's going on with kids. And I speak to young girls all the time. They're like, "Oh, I don't feel good enough to wear the hijab. I don't feel pretty enough because they're looking at an image that was man made. Even the models get get um, photoshopped. They don't even look like yeah, that on the oh, on the It's like everything is fake now. It's, yeah, everything it's so fake. cheap. Sure. And when you see the celebrities in real life, you're like, I saw Hugh Hefner in um in Winter Wonderland um in London, and like I saw him and he was just wrinkled up, mm. like he looked like he was literally wink- wrinkled up and he looked nothing like how he looks on the screen. And I was just looking at him like, wow, he looks nothing to what in in, in real life. I would not know that's Hugh Hefner because um, someone pointed it out to me. I was like, oh, that is Hugh Hefner because he just looked completely different. So we have to realize that everything is photoshopped. Nothing is real. Whatever you see on that screen is not real. Those women don't even look like that. They they have to go through surgery. They have to go through hours of tanning, airbrushing, all this stuff just to look like that. And who has time for that? So fun, like it's like um, you know, in the society. I mean, obviously you're doing the you know transformational coaching. So people, it shows that how people are so fixated on looks instead of like their personalities like yeah. people worry more about their you know the outer appearance than the personality right you know and we should spend more time trying to beautify our personalities exactly you know, because it comes from religion with others rather than yeah. you know just how you look on the outside but people are still doing that and you know you think especially with all the self-help and like you know gurus and stuff like that they're out there there's so many people they still you know they'll say oh mashallah and yes and like people enjoy listening to you know these kind of encouraging talks and you know inspirational like quotes and things but people are still not really applying it properly right exactly because they're still looking at the look they're still looking at the superficial aspect of it and you know alhamdulillah i'm i'm going to be um doing a podcast with ruby Fremont, and she's a non-muslim but Mm -hmm. she wants me to speak about my spiritual journey she's like what you're doing in the coaching world is not is not being seen before because I went the up and mm. I'm excited in my business and I'm very unapologetic about who I am I'm very uh, um, very outspoken I speak I speak about things that people don't want to speak about I speak about taboo like divorce abuse all these things and she was like that in the coaching space is like we consider that as a thought leader that you are breaking that this is cultural stuff in, in Islam we speak about these things 
we speak that like, the Prophet was never shy to speak the truth because Allah's not uh, Allah's not shy to speak the truth. So, like for me, then the niqab has never hindered me from doing anything. It's just the way that you perceive it. And if you just like you said about personality, your personality shines more when you wear the niqab. Mm. Like, that's the only thing you can judge. Like, technically, that's your identity. Because Islam, when there's an ayah in the Quran where Allah says the Prophet was sent to perfect the manners, your character, your character is so important that when you have good character, it shines, it shows. And like, what better way to show your character than, you know, when you wear the hijab, when you wear the niqab, it helps people only judge you by your character. Because yeah. what else can they look at? Because we're so used to looking at people and thinking, oh, she's beautiful, so let me go and speak to her, or let me go follow her, or let me go like her photo just because she's beautiful. Yeah, subhanAllah. So it's, it's more about the content than anything else. Yeah. Your personality, like, a, not, not how you yeah. look. And I'm a human being. Just, yeah. just going to back to what you mentioned about the taboos and um, subjects and things like that. I think this is one of the problems that, you know, we face as Muslims because there's a lot of our cultures which, you know, you can't talk about things like sex and, you know, right. like when things like puberty and stuff like that. A lot of parents don't actually discuss these things with their children. So right. can you imagine like how like traumatized the child must be that if they've been like abused or something like that. I've met a sister, subhanAllah, she openly like talked about how she was sexually abused by her uncle. Yeah. And her own mother like basically just told her that she should just forget about it and not say anything i mean so, can you imagine and this is like and i don't know how the sister like you know mashallah she seemed re very strong you know like but you know she she wanted she was very open and she wanted to like talk about you know this kind of things but mm -hmm. these things are happening to people and everybody thinks oh yeah we have to keep quiet about it you know but it's not part of our religion to it's like, not, not talk exactly. about these things you know, right. and it's, those, those, these kind of things, we need to talk about them. They should be, out, and people like that who do stuff like that, they should be outed, not protected and covered up and like, oh, because she said that when she goes to, for example, to family events, you know, the uncle's there, you know, so, and uh, like, you know, she faces anxiety. She's ex obviously, it's a family event, a wedding or whatever, and she, you know, everybody's expected to go. And when she does go, then and she sees the uncle, she, she starts having panic attacks because, you know, she's yeah. having anxiety because obviously, obviously it's just trauma that she's lived through, but he's still accepted in the family. And she, she was the one who was shamed you know for like talking about it anytime like she wants to like bring it out or something like that she's shamed and oh yeah what did you do and it must be your fault and this kind of ridiculous you know accusations you know this victim shaming subhanallah and you know it's so funny you say that when i was working in saudi i was sexually assaulted i was literally like i was, uh -huh. so, I was sexually assaulted yeah and you know the first thing that they asked me where you went hijab well i was wearing uh -huh. the club i was covered from head to toe mate but that doesn't give the excuse and this is this is what it is we're so we have to brush that under the carpet but this is the reason why so many kids are being abused because the kids don't even know in the beginning they say the studies yeah. have shown that people who have been abused don't realize until like the age of yeah, being abused yeah exactly yeah. until they, until like the age is like a certain age that they hear and they're like oh my god i was abused and the this this is the reason why because we're not talking about it we're not telling people what the signs are we're mm. not showing people that you can heal from it you can overcome any trauma we're just told brush under the carpet don't speak about it and that's that's traumatizing and the fact that we victim shame like the prophet also never victim shame he, yeah he was like he, he never victim shame and, and i don't know where we get this from it's some culture obviously that it's terrible know, it's, yeah, yeah. But it doesn't make any sense you know because i remember there's even a hadith that it talks about um i can't remember which female companion it was but she was a young girl and basically mm. she was with the prophet they was traveling there was like a group of people traveling and she was riding her horse and basically she must have just started her period for the first time yeah and um the Prophet he he just by the, by the way she kind of started acting like a bit shy and stuff he could tell that yes yeah, something must like that must have happened so he asked her like you know have you started your period basically and it's just like I thought to myself like when I was reading this hadith I thought to myself like how many girls Muslim girls today can even like talk to their own fathers like, like that, to say that they're on their period like, of them and this, yeah, this is, this is, is Salaam was not this girl's father. Do you know what I mean? He wasn't her yeah. father, and they were traveling. But he and and the way he dealt with it, he made her feel so comfortable. Like the, he made sure she didn't feel ashamed that she started her period. He just told her to go and like you know get herself cleaned up, and then he even gave her a gift afterwards. Do you know what I mean? Oh. Just so she wouldn't feel uncomfortable that and embarrassed that you know that she started her period while they was traveling because this is something natural. 
and yeah. yeah you and they're made to feel like oh you know it's, it's, you're dirty you're you're dirty now Thank because you. you've got a period or something like that okay. it's, it's just not it doesn't make any sense and that, you know that comes from um i remember that like, when i studied um christianity that comes from like christianity that you know women are dead i think it's judaism as well i don't know if it's like the torah but there's part of those two cultures that um collide when it comes to women that women are seen as dirty on their periods and mm. i think we're just being colonized there's a color there's a colonization that we've all gone through where we've completely like um turned it like we've we detached ourselves from the dean and we've implemented culture other things yes definitely yeah other things that other cultures this is not it's not even from our culture as, a, as muslims that like, we have a culture we have the sunnah it's not mm. even from there like, just like what you said about the prophet how how like how open he was and how you know compassionate there's no compassion anymore yeah. like, like we have no compassion for each other like if, so, if someone came like um to, to an imam say i was sexually abused there's no compassion there mm. it's just like well you know are you were you really and um, what were you doing how did you like it's always like the victim is always asked like what did you do but the victim is already feeling ashamed like so many people subhanallah the victims that I, i've worked with severe sexual abuse cases and the victims always think it's their fault the victims always say that i was a bad person i'm the one who who did this to myself it's my fault maybe because i look too pretty maybe because i had my hair was out but like one girl i remember she said to me that my hair was red and that's the reason why i was sexually abused I was like, she refused to cut her hair and after a second with me she had a haircut after 19 years of this is like subhanallah she she hated herself that much because she was shamed into believing that it was her fault that like it was her fault that's the reason why she was abused and it's so mm -hmm. sad it's so sad to hear it so um another thing i would like to well, mashallah this is such a big topic but it's i want to topic. talk um <laughs> yeah it is so fun. i think we need um i think we need an injury I just do. to be on this topic <laughs> Uh, yeah, because yeah, it's 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 just um it's it's massive basically. But uh, what I want to um ask you about now, basically, just to talk about a little bit um feminism and yeah. club, because I think that um well I'm I'm definitely not a feminist. Okay, yeah, and people uh, keep accusing me of being a feminist as well. But it's just I think um obviously being a muslim woman generally people have a association with islam that they believe it's a misogynistic religion and it's against women and um and this is not entirely you know it's not entirely um or what well, can i say it's not it's not non-muslim short that they have this kind of perception when you look at certain muslim cultures and they they do treat women bad you yeah. know they do oppress women but it's not from the religion itself it's from the cultures or associated cultures so there's a misconception that you know because you're covering or you we're covering because of the men which you know this is one of the things that i think when you're giving doubt to people um it's one of the mistakes that sometimes people have made in the past that oh you yeah, know we, we're covering because um you know to protect ourselves from men and these kind of things but it's like you've already mentioned earlier that he was even sexually abused with um wearing a car yeah. in saudi arabia so exactly. it's not it's not about what you're covering how, how you're dressed um because even if you are covered from head to foot if a man wants to sexually abuse you he's gonna do it thank because, you because, because it's a disease have, in his heart you, you know, know Allah says you know Allah says in the Quran, which is what I love about this deen, yeah? yeah. So many ayahs were revealed for the women. Look at Aisha radiallahu anha when she was slandered. The ayah was revealed yeah. for her, to, to protect her. To Allah was on her side. Just like Mughira, when um his wife left him and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi I forgot what his wife's name is. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked her, are you going to, like, you know, the poor guy, you left him and he's crying for you. And she was like, are you commanding me to stay with this man when I don't want to? And she yeah. made dua. She goes, I'm going to make dua over and over again until Allah reveals to me what I have to do in the situation. And then Allah revealed the ayah for her. That, and oh, even Zainab, yeah. when Zainab wanted to get divorced from Zaid because she wasn't happy, uh, that, that was allowed. Do, do you understand that? Like, and the Sahaba used to say it, it's as if the Quran was revealed for the women. They used to, they used to think that the, the, that the women have so much protection. They exactly. Like, look at the difference in opinion now. Look at the yeah. difference in opinion now. Because at that time, people could see that actually this is liberating women and it's yeah. giving them the right to do so many things. But now, people, you know, the Muslims especially, they look at it as if to say, oh, it's all in favour of the men, you know? But they don't seem to realise, even in the Quran, when when Allah talks about um, the woman covering, first Allah tells the man to lower his gaze. Right, so thank even you. If a woman, even if a woman is walking down the street naked, the man shouldn't be looking. You're exactly. not supposed to be looking. 
you know, so it was after after Allah told the man to lower his gaze, then he told the woman to, that she should um, cover herself. Exactly. So why is it that, you know, it's all, we, we always look at it from the other way. Oh, woman, you're supposed to wear your hijab. Yes, we're supposed to wear the hijab, but you should be lowering your gaze. You're supposed okay. to lower your gaze first. It reminds, yeah, it reminds of the hadith where the Prophet where a man was looking at a woman and he turned the man's face away. He didn't go to the woman, go cover yourself. He didn't yeah. go, go and like, make her feel bad about it. Because she's a victim in that situation. The man is looking at her. She's probably covered. She probably wasn't wearing a garb, but he turned the man's face away. And so this is from, I remember with... that hadith, yeah. and especially the 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 the, the guy, the, the Sahaba that he that, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam turned his head. He yeah. said that the, the Prophet grabbed his head and turned it. He thought his neck would break. <laughs> I remember laughing. You see that? that. You know so the you that, well, Yeah, and one thing I love when I read about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sira, he he was an ad, he was an advocate for women. And no one sees that. And people think that the pro and this is what you know what I find that so many men, especially the Muslim men, use the examples of the Sahabas and the ima and the Imams that came after to justify mm -hmm. their their uh, like the way that they are. But they're not using the Prophet as the guidance yeah. and the role model. They're using like you know Umar ibn Khattab. He was the he was guaranteed uh, he was granted Jannah. He was he was a great man. He had his um personality but we should be following the prophet does that make sense but people yeah. look for other things to justify their actions the prophet doesn't look at the way he was with women he never hit a woman he never he never shamed the woman he never made a woman feel bad about herself he encouraged women to come out and pray you know for eid he he, mm -hmm. he made sure that the women felt he even gave like a day for the women to learn the deen yeah and it's like us women are so shamed and exactly and like given the context before islam came women were just seen as disposable goods and that's how it's gone back to now. We are just seen as disposable goods. Before Islam came, women were just, you know, they were seen as, you know, just, just like some piece of meat to sleep with and that's it. Men used to abuse the women. They could do whatever they wanted with the women and women were seen as nothing. And this is what we're going back to now. And it's because of the culture. The culture, we have a culture that women should not be seen or heard. That doesn't come from Islam. That comes from yeah. like other religions. That comes yeah. from different cultures. That does not come from Islam. I, I have never, I have read the Quran. When I read it, when I reverted, nowhere did I see in the Quran where Allah says, women go hide in your house. Actually, Allah says in the Quran, uh, women mind how you speak because a man has a disease in his heart. He's mm. telling the women, men have a disease in their heart. Do you see that? Yeah. He, Allah knows how, how he's speaking. Not, not the women have a disease yeah. in their voice. Damn, serious. <laughs> it's the men. The, 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 the responsibility falls on the man. Because Allah says the man has a disease in his heart. And when you hear these men like, you know, puffing their chest out, telling women you need to go at home, you need to stay at home and cover yourselves, that you have that disease in your heart, not the women. It's not the women who are the issue here. Yes, we are all responsible for ourselves. Of course we are. I'm responsible for how I act. I'm responsible for the way I dress. But it's not to excuse your responsibility. Exactly. And you can't use that as an excuse to say, oh, well, because you're dressed like that, I'm just going to, you know, you know, shut you down and victim shame, you know. And that's what's happening right now, unfortunately. SubhanAllah. Because the reality is, I mean, if we focus on the wrong things, this is how I, th I think a lot of young girls now, they're misinterpreting the religion. They see it as yeah. something oppressive and they don't understand it. Because I find in like with, you know, just from people that I know, raising daughters especially, they worry so much about their daughters if they're going to be wearing hijab and covering and, you know, not having boyfriends and these kind of things. But when it comes to their sons, they don't even yeah. think of them. They don't well, think about what the sons are doing at all. Well, you know, yeah. they, it's like the sons, they're just there. And, you know, if the son does one good thing, maybe he, you know, for the first time in, in the week, he put his rubbish in the bin, you know, at home. Then, oh, mashallah, my son's such a good guy. You know, he's so, he's so brilliant. He's such a good son. Right. Daughter, you complain about the daughter. You give her a hard time. You put pressure on her. Nothing she does is good enough. Nothing she does is right. right. You know? And that's what builds that belief that I'm not good enough. And that's why the girls go out there looking for attention from everyone else. I know because I was, you know what? Some people might get triggered when I say these things because I've been there. I, I only ever ex um, speak from experience. When I talk about things, it's because I've been there. I had no father there and I was looking for a father figure in my life. And I was doing that by getting validation from men. And I speak to, you know, I get hundreds of DMs in my Instagram of girls who say to me, I'm struggling to wear the hijab. I want to wear it, but I want to take it off. I don't know why. There's other women who say that, you know, I, I just don't want to pray anymore. I, I can't deal with this. Like people telling me that I'm not a Muslim or that they're victim shaming me. There's so many girls who are going through this. And it's because we have been taught the wrong aspect of the deen. We've been mm -hmm. like, it's been misconstrued. And like no one, no one talks about these things. And you know what it is? It's like when, when people see a Muslim, they, 
instantly think, oh, that person's perfect. So whatever they say is gold. Does that make sense? Yeah. Especially yeah. when you're higher up. People say, oh, he's perfect. He can't say anything wrong because he studied for 20 years. He's, you know, he's like a, a person of knowledge. And like when the person is speaking about the women is in a very disrespectful manner. And people are accept, accepting exactly. that. And people are been, accepting it. Yeah, and I've seen it so many times. People are accepting it. And this is the issue. Like, people are accepting the, the girls being, feeling like they, they don't belong. You know, as, as human beings, we have three needs. To belong, to connect, and to feel good enough, to feel loved. And mm -hmm. when you don't feel like you belong, because Allah says in the Quran, he's created us in tribes, meaning we all belong to someone. We belong yeah. to someone. And when you don't feel like you belong, you will start finding ways to connect to them for ways yeah yeah people turn to drugs you know how many how many how many sisters are in my inbox telling me that they you know they drink they, they they're having in uh, you know um they committing intercourse with other mm -hmm. other men outside of marriage this is happening it's real life issues and no one's talking about it because we're trying to hide it they know we're muslims just hide it no we can't yeah, everything because... everything hidden by everything on the yeah. outside we do we it's focus on perfect. the outside as long as it yeah. lives on the outside and it's wrong. I think another issue, I think, with the hijab in particular, generally, um, is when you connect it to, you know, because of a man, okay, I'm doing this because of a man, then yeah. when things like, for example, especially I've seen this with women many times, it happens a lot with the revert sisters as well. So, for example, somebody becomes a Muslim, you know, they start wearing hijab and like, you know, they get married straight away. They haven't yeah. really learned much about the religion and then what happens a lot of the time especially if um people are in um you know in mixed culture you know marriages where yeah. maybe the husband he's from you know a, a family like a muslim family he's you know being raised as a muslim arab or asian or whatever a lot of the time he tries to put that culture on top on his wife basically yeah so exactly. try to make her into you know how his mum is or how you know he was raised and how he's seen the women in his culture even though he believes that he's very open-minded and you know obviously he but he, he thinks he's open-minded automatically because he hasn't married a woman from his culture so he automatically thinks he's more open-minded but at the same time he would try to force his way of um you know understanding of women from what he knows onto the new wife yeah and then sometimes it becomes so overwhelming for her yeah. You know, she she doesn't understand why why I'm not uh, well, for example I'm not Sudanese why is he trying to make me do what Sudanese women do exactly. you know and it's not and it's, there's a confusion there because I think a lot of sisters what happened they become confused because they haven't taken time to learn about Islam properly for themselves right. so when they get like when this other culture gets pushed on top of them they believe that oh well this must be what Islam is because oh he's Muslim he's from a Muslim family and they're all saying the same things you know they're all saying that I should do this and I should do that. So if they don't take time to really learn about Islam for themselves, often if they get overwhelmed, eventually the marriage breaks down. And what yeah. happens? The hijab comes off, the bayah mm -hmm. comes off, the religion is, you know, finished, everything. You know, she right. completely cuts herself off from, you know, everything. And it's just like, this is this is why women need to be educated properly, especially right. in your religion. Your, it's not, Islam is not just a religion, it's a way of living. You know, you need to understand your way of living for yourself, not because of a man, not because he's told you that uh, this is how he thinks you should be and things like that. Even today, a sister sent me, I think, you know, it was yesterday or the day before, she sent me a message asking me, um, how can she wear the niqab? Because, you know, her husband, like, doesn't want her to wear it. She's a revert. She wants to wear the niqab. And this is not the first time I've heard this. I've, I've known many sisters, they've had the same issue, you know, reverts and non-reverts. They'll ask me, oh, you know, how can I wear the niqab? I really want to wear it, but my husband doesn't want me to wear it. So this is op this is the opposite of what most people think, um, you know, people um, that women are covering, that you were forced into covering up, for example. And I, I remember when I was at university, it was so funny. I remember I used to go to the shop and the guy goes, oh, why have you covered your face? Like, does your does your dad force you to do that? So first of all, I ain't got a dad. I don't know where he is. Secondly, mm. I live on campus. So I don't even live with my family. I'm living on campus. I live on the student halls and I'm in the niqab and he had nothing to say. I said, no one forced me to do this. It was my choice. And after that, after that day, he was so nice to me. But even me for myself, when I got divorced, Alhamdulillah, because I had this firm belief in like, this is my freedom. Um, Alhamdulillah, I didn't take the niqab off or the hijab off. It just made me more firm in my being. But I do know I have like there are cases where sisters have like taken the hijab off. And this is why I always say. Don't get married because you want someone to love you. Exactly. Don't get married because you say, I want to be in love and I want the man to love me. Find yourself first.
Like, honestly, there are sisters who say to me, I just want to get married because I want someone to love me. Well, that's a recipe for disaster, first mm-hmm. of all. Because no one can ever love you the way you love yourself and the way that Allah loves you. Because Allah always uh, says there's a hadith that um, when you know yourself, you know Allah. So mm. you, have to be, you have to be rooted to yourself and you have to love yourself. And I mean deeply love yourself and know yourself so well that no one can tell you or dictate to you how to live your life. You make that choice according to what pleases Allah. And this is what happens. So many sisters make their husbands their God. They're waiting for his permission to do something. And this is not from the deen. It's not from exactly. the deen. Like, look at Asiya. She could have stayed with Firaun, but she chose not to. And he, he had a kingdom. He was rich. She could have she could have chosen to stay with him for the sake of like just being comfortable, but she chose not to. And this is what happens with a lot of women. They choose, okay, let me just stick with what he's saying and not, not use my own aql. Like Allah says, verify yeah. the fact. Verify the facts in case you make a, a judgment out of ignorance. You have to verify the facts. You have to learn your deen. You have to also seek knowledge and not just put that on your husband. That's also your obligation as a woman. Definitely. You have to know. You have to know Allah. You have to know who your Lord is. You have to know who you're praying to. Like you're not you're not praying to your husband, you're not praying to make your husband happy. You are praying to make Allah happy, to give Allah his rights, because Allah has rights over you. And this is a misconception that so many women have because again, we've been indoctrinated, we've been colonized, the Christian mentality, because obviously I think it's Catholicism that don't believe in divorce. They don't believe they believe that women should be like, you know, serving their husbands. I remember when I was in the church, I remember someone said that um the the woman that doesn't that women should be beaten if they don't obey their husbands. I remember that in the church. Yeah, women should be beaten. Like you should be, a woman should be beaten for not obeying a husband. This comes from Christianity. It doesn't come from Deen. It does not come from Islam. And even when it comes to like disciplining the wife or giving her some kind of um, advice, it, there's a system to it. Do you get me? But no, mm-hmm. no, not many women know this. Not many women know their rights because they just go blindly into a marriage thinking that the man's going to fix their whole life. And that doesn't happen, unfortunately. Like that would be amazing if a man could come and fix your life, but they can't. A man can't fix your life if you don't know yourself. And ignorance is ignorance is oppression. People don't realize, but ignorance is oppression. So if you don't educate yourself and give yourself, you know, find yourself, you know, with some knowledge that you can act upon yourself, then you're going to end up in the wrong position. And I find this with a lot of sisters. You know, when it comes to learning the deen, oh, don't I, I don't need to come to the mock. My husband will tell me he'll, you know, he'll he goes to lectures and he's got a lot of knowledge. And right. Like, and I, so when people say that, I just think like so like is it do you feel comfortable saying how can you feel comfortable saying that oh my husband's got so much islamic knowledge what what does that how does that help you because for the men they don't tell they don't really teach their families about islam they should but they don't really teach them about islam they're going to just tell their families what is going to be comfortable for them that's going to suit them and going to be an advantage to them you know right how many how many people are honest enough to go home and talk about and for example how many men would go home and say do you know what wife or children you know if you see me doing such and such then please tell me so i can correct myself how exactly. many do that how, how many? many parents do that you know, this is it, they, they, you wouldn't so it's important to learn these things for yourself because the reality i've heard from a sister even a few weeks ago she said oh you know the men they when they go to the masjid they're only taught um you know basically like about the men's um like rights and like from the man's side so when they come home then you know apparently she said basically her husband when he came home he because she apparently she had she's prone to get angry sometimes okay mm. so she said she can be a bit short-tempered and the husband told her that oh because yeah she's going to be um that she's going to go to hell <laughs> just oh, so, like, who are you to make that judgment how could, you, how could you come home from the masjid <laughs> and just tell your wife that she's gonna go to hell? it's like i just what? like i don't you know i don't want to laugh about these things but, the, funny. I know, but you can't help all the time yeah. And can you imagine if you're a woman and you're like, especially if you're, you know, working at home, yeah, you, your husband goes out and, you know, he provides for you and these kind of things, you know, how, what does that do to your self-worth as a person? Uh, it lowers you. And then, and then the same sister, she said to me, this is why, um, you know, the young girls now, they don't want to marry men from their culture. They, they want to find English men to get married to. And right. that isn't that isn't a good reason to want to marry somebody that's English. Exactly. <laughs> you know? It shouldn't. I mean, it shouldn't be. It's so true, and it should be about compatibility and about how you, like you know, I always say that when you are a whole woman, when you've healed yourself, you will attract a whole man. 
you will mm. attract a man who's whole. It doesn't matter what culture he comes from because it, it's all you. You know, the, you know what? The, the religion is the religion of responsibility and looking at yourself. Allah says he will not change the condition of people until, he cha- until you change what's within yourself. So it all goes back to you. What are you doing to, you know, be in this situation? And if you're ignorant enough to say that, oh, my husband's going to take me to Jannah, no, because you have to take yourself to Jannah as well, you know. You have to, yeah. you have to pray the Salah. Your husband can't do it for you. And I, I remember, like, hearing about parents making a Salah for their kids. You can't do that. Your kids have to pray the Salah themselves. Yeah. You, you, can't, you can't be doing that. Like, everyone has to take themselves to Jannah. You have to put in the effort. So, like, I know there's so many sisters out there who are probably listening to this thinking, oh, that's me. But there's a way out. You can go and go to the masjid and learn your deen and start, like, you know, listening to lectures and um, being around women who understand the religion and are able to give you that compassion and that mercy. And I find that women need to be around women. We need, we need to like form groups of women where we can openly open these spaces so that we can speak, like, judgment-free. Because when, you, when you're around a man, obviously it's different when you're trying to ask, like, um, ask a question about knowledge about the dean is very difficult because obviously the men don't understand but when you're around women who understand and they give you like a space to speak and a space to express yourself that's how women heal when women can express themselves mm-hmm. and when you're stifling yourself all the time and suppressing yourself and telling yourself that you're a bad wife you're a bad mother you, you're bad and you're going to Jahannam like oh my god like subhanallah like, I remember hearing this I remember being told this all the time when I was married being told I'm going to Jahannam because I'm a woman that comes from Christianity yes there's hadith about it but this comes from Christianity this all come, I promise you this comes from Christianity because I've, I've lived the religion I've been in that religion and that comes from women are seen as the devil actually in Christianity they're told that we get periods as a punishment for making yeah, Adam eat the apple the, yeah, ad, yeah the apple yeah, yeah. So we have this Christian mentality and we don't even realize it. And then when you speak out against it, you're takfiyad, you call the khawarij, you call this, you're off the deen, and this is not, it's not, it's, it's because there is, it's a culture of um, victimizing a woman and making, and demonizing a woman. This is what happens when women speak out, women are demonized. They're mm-hmm. told like you're too much. But look at Khadija radiallahu anha. Look at all Aisha radiallahu anha. She was a scholar. You know, I guess they were inspired by the Sahabiyats because they were scholars. They were working. They were out in the in the in the in the society in war. They were out in the battlefield. Like the women were doing things, and we don't realize this. We don't know our deen. We don't and know the, the thing is as well. Even the men from those times, they didn't have any problem with going Thank to you. those women to seek knowledge. Well, it wasn't something. It wasn't something that was seen as beneath them or shameful right. to them. Or anything. Oh, so I'm getting passionate. Yeah, I'm so sorry, but seriously, like I've I've lived it. I've seen both sides of the spectrum. And I speak from experience. This dean came to liberate the women. I promise you, whoever's listening to this, the dean came to liberate you. It came to give you your freedom, to give you your rights. And you should grab it with both hands because this is an opportunity for you to get your freedom back. Like, just like you were saying, the men were not even shy to go to the women for help or for knowledge. That is deep. Mm. I, I don't know if anyone sees that. That's really deep. That's like, that's inspiring and enlightening that we as women have a place in society because we're raising the next generation and if you're raising it from a place of i'm not good enough and i'm a bad person your kids are going to feel the same way and you're going to raise the next generation of broken children traumatized children children who don't know themselves because their parents were not were not mentally well they're not spiritually well they were not spiritually connected to allah they were not connected to themselves and that's raising the kids that, that's, that's what's raising the kids, broken mentalities. Yeah, definitely. And I think as well, especially for a lot of women, there's this, you know, misconception. I mean, I know a lot of sisters who are highly educated and they're, you know, they, they, they work at home. They're looking after the family, they're looking after, you know, the house and everything. And some people might look and say, well, what's the point in, you know, being a university graduate or having a PhD or master's and, you know, you don't actually go out to work. There's a big point in it because you're somebody who's educated. You have educated mind. You understand how to seek knowledge. You understand yeah. how to process it. You understand how to apply it practically in your daily life. And if yeah. you if you marry, if you if you're raising a family, especially a young family, you can help and support those children properly to have healthy minds really? and the way that they thinking, the way that they grow, so they they can see that you can be somebody who does stay at home and take care of a family, but still be educated because there's nothing wrong with that. And yeah. still after that, once your family is old enough to take care of themselves, then you can still go out and work outside and get a job outside if necessary. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. If that's what you want to do, rather than doing it the Western way, which is, oh, let me go to university and then work. Right. 
amount of years and then by the time I'm you know almost going to be menopausal then th let me try to find a husband now or let me try to have some kids now exactly you know? and then you feel and then and then there's problems because you, you you're struggling to maybe conceive because you've left right. you've waited for till you're later on in life these are scientific facts that you know there's right. no that I'm you know people might not like what I'm saying but these are the facts the reality is you right. cannot change nature Exactly, seen, and it's not that women can't have children when they're older, but from my experience and from what I've seen, just generally, even just looking around the world, the women who start having children at a younger age mm. can have children for a longer period of time, right? Without you know having to try to have a baby, you know, exactly. if that makes That's, sense. Like, yeah, for example, in my, in my own family, my I think my um, my grandma, I think maybe her first child she might have had like maybe she was like sixteen or so. But she gave birth to my dad when she was in her forties. No way! You know I envious when I hear that. You know, when, when people have kids when they're sixteen, I would love to have babies when I'm sixteen, get married. You know, this is what I want for my kids as well. I want them to know that you marriage know, is healthy. Exactly, because because this this is the thing. That's what I've noticed. Like people who have people, and I've, I've heard this from many people. You know that you know from back home, like Africa and even Asian countries. They've had they've had they've given birth to many children over a you know right. period of years, and you know they started out early, but then even in their forties they didn't have problem conceiving. It wasn't that they was even trying to conceive, but they conceived okay. naturally, and the children were born you know healthily. Do you know what I mean without having okay. you know a whole issue of health problems, these kind of things. So it's something that is being quite it's quite normal. So yeah. women shouldn't be discouraged as to seeking education, but as also having a family because you can do both. Yeah. You can, yeah. of course. The I, you, know, I was, you can do both. It's about balance. I know you, oh. you technically you can't have. A, who says people say you can't have everything in life? But with with the right balance, you know, and taking things, you know, in in each in its time, you can be able to achieve those things. There's no reason why you can't do that. It's true, and I want to touch up on that actually. When I had, um, I was like, when I got married, I was studying law. I was in my second year of university. I finished and got fell pregnant. Actually, found that I was pregnant. Oh, on graduation day so I was like a little present and then I had my son and I went and did my salter and I went to Saudi with I was okay. pregnant five months pregnant and I had my son that didn't stop me I've traveled the world with my kids I'm okay. telling you now if you feel like you know um kids stop you or you can't do both you can totally have both worlds you can travel you can get an education and have kids and have a family like take it from me I've done it Alhamdulillah, only by the will of Allah and the grace of Allah. But I've I've worked towards that. I was in college studying the Salta and it was hard. It was like teaching. You have to teach and you have to learn about grammar and all this stuff. And then I got a job afterwards and I took my kids abroad. So it's possible. It's all possible. You just have to train your mindset to look of for the course. opportunity. Yeah. I you think, I think most people think of children as being um what do you make it like a like it's just like your life has been put on hold basically you're right. you exactly. can't do anything because oh yeah you've got kids now so you have to be responsible for them therefore you can't go anywhere there's mashallah there's a um there's a sister well it's a sister a couple muslim couple a sister and her husband because they're called five adventures they're on instagram as well and i follow yeah. them mashallah amazing like i love following them because upon that they go with their three children and they travel like literally everywhere they go like it's called five adventures they're really it's just really amazing to like yeah. journeys you know they've got these kids and when people say oh i can't travel because of the kids it's like i look at them and i just think like are you okay like <laughs> it's not you can't it's not that you can't travel because of the kids because you made it a problem travel because of you you don't yeah. want and you know, I traveled, I traveled with my kids to Egypt and we had a great time in Egypt, right? My daughter was like four months old. And you mm. know what's so funny? I, I gave birth to my, my um, third daughter, my third kid, and I'd passed my driving within two, three weeks of her being born. It's all mm. your mindset. It's the yeah. way you think. And it's the way that, you know, right now you have people talking about the elections and we're doomed. No, we're not because the world is a beautiful place. We have mm. a lot. This world is beautiful. It's the way you see the world. You have to change your perspective. Honestly, you change your perspective about life and you start thinking in possibilities. You, you know what is so funny? I always say this. You are not that clever to think an impossible thought. You're not that clever. Yeah, yeah, You're, so not that clever. <laughs> You're not. You're not that clever to think an impossible thought, but you make things impossible for yourself because you keep thinking that you're that clever to make it impossible. That like Allah just says be and it is. All you have to do is ask him. And the reason why you haven't got the life that you want is because you haven't asked Allah. That's why. 
you mm-hmm. haven't asked and you, you haven't received. When you go to Allah and you be very specific in your du'a and say, I just want this. I want to travel. I want to educate. I want to, you know, I want to have an education. I want to be whatever. I want a career. Allah will give it to you. And if it's not good for you, he will give you something better. And you have to believe in that. You have to see that. You know, Islam is a, is a religion about seeing the positive side about life. Mm-hmm. Always seeing the positive. Like even Allah says in the Quran, verily with hardship comes ease, meaning that you're not supposed to be stuck in hardship because there's two eases with every hardship. Exactly. Meaning you, you go through it and you come out, out out of it. You come out of the hardship better than ever. Mm-hmm. So if people, if you're stuck right now, you're choosing to be stuck. That's your choice. You're making that a choice and you're making it impossible for yourself because you're choosing to see the bad rather than the good. SubhanAllah. So uh, our last <laughs> question. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, this is yeah. deep, you know. I hope I hope everyone's enjoying this. I really do hope, yeah, and I'm very hope. passionate about this. So I hope it's not putting people off thinking, "Oh my God, she's like." Inshallah, I don't think so. Inshallah, but I think also we've mentioned a lot of things. I mean, I have my little list of questions. I think we've pretty much covered most things. But yeah. you've mentioned travel just now, so just more on a, on a more practical. Um, level of like wearing the niqab like how do you find traveling with niqab and everything like oh i want a niqab at airport if they ask me to say, show my face i'm like yeah um female security can you take me and they take me i show my face i laugh with them and they let me go it's just the way it's the way that you portray yourself like when yeah. i i have a lot of positive energy around me and i make sure that i exude positivity so when i go to the airport no one ever thinks of me as, as, a, as a as a threat like mm-hmm. i have not had that issue at all I only had it I, I had it in Egypt actually I had that issue in Egypt but that was that was a different case scenario I think they like they misconstrued like why we were in Egypt that was like we just there for a holiday but I've never had any issue in in the UK with my Nicole ever I actually have been treated like royalty like one guy was like yeah let's go through I was like okay cool like there's no issue because the way that you portray is the way you see the Nicole if yeah. you see it as a because I know I know sisters yeah and this is like I heard this that some women wear the Nicole because they don't feel like they're beautiful so they wear the niqab to cover their face because they don't feel like they're beautiful. And this is a known fact. And there's a lot of women who do that. And- you know, that's, you, you, now you're saying that it's funny because I had this experience with a sister. Um, and basically, she doesn't wear the niqab. She wears, yeah. She's worn it sometimes, like, you know, maybe to like events and things like that. But she doesn't wear it like, you know, full time. And she said to me that, oh, um, she she said to me like kind of jokingly once, she's like, oh, um, you know, I think I should start wearing the niqab because, you know, it will help me. It will stop me from getting too dark. Yeah. And that's Saudi. Guys, <laughs> Basically. Women in, Saudi, women in Saudi wear the niqab so that they don't turn brown. That is a known fact. And that's and I've spoken to many Saudi women who do that. So it's funny that you're saying that because that's Seriously. also what we do. I thought to myself, you know, if you're wearing it for that reason, make sure you cover your eyes as well because yeah. it doesn't work <laughs> yeah. well. But I remember when I was in New Zealand, I ended up getting a tan on my eyes, and I, when I took my makeup off, I looked ridiculous. My siblings was just laughing at me because I looked like a panda. <laughs> just like got tan around your eyes, and I was just thinking, oh, this is terrible. Like, how do I how do I counter this? So. oh my gosh can you imagine yeah so i know so many like and there's a way that you portray the niqab to yourself like if you and i know for a fact and i know like people might not agree with me but when i got punched on the bus i know for a fact myself i felt like i'm an issue i felt like oh i'm i'm a niqab and people must be looking at me and thinking that i'm a bad person and i'm not saying what the guy did to me is justified it's not but it's how i remember in that time in that space i felt like oh people are going to look at me in a weird way that's how I was feeling about myself during that time. I was thinking, oh, like, I'm, I, is it an issue for me to be on this bus? Do I have a place here? I was doubting myself. Mm. But now, now when, I, when I'm out on the streets, people smile at me. People literally smile at me and they speak to me. Because of the way I, I present myself and the way I walk, the, how confident I look, the positive uh, energy that I display, that people speak to me, non-Muslims speak to me, Muslims speak to me. It's like, it's not a thing. It's just the way you perceive yourself and they will reflect on, on your daily outgoing. So yeah, it never been a problem for me at the airport. SubhanAllah. So uh, just to wrap this up now, because we've just gone past an hour. Yeah, okay. yeah. I know we can talk for a long time. <laughs> but I'm going to ask you just one final question. Like, basically, what advice or encouragement would you give to any sisters who were thinking about wearing the niqab or maybe they've taken it off because of a bad experience they had with their husband or ex-husband or like just like you had a, a similar bad experience on the bus for yeah. example you faced abuse what would you what advice would you give so 
So I would say I would say to reconnect with Allah and reconnect with yourself, and you will find out whether you want to wear the niqab again or if you don't. It's entirely your choice, but reconnect with yourself because when you're disconnected from yourself, you start disconnecting yourself from the deen, and you start trying to. You may want to take your hijab off next. You may want to take you know just like take everything off and just like look like everyone else. So I would say to that person to reconnect with yourself, to find yourself again, and find like make istikhara. Make dua to Allah to keep you firm in your deen. And you will know what to do after that. Allah will guide you to it. You just got to trust Allah and his signs. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, sister. Thank you for giving me your time and sharing your experiences and your knowledge with us. Jazakallah khair. Wa'ayaki. And jazakallah khair for having me on. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam.